Section 17 of Heart of the West. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rebecca Bronard Plunkett. Heart of the West by O. Henry. 17. Christmas by Injunction. Cherokee was the civic father of Yellowhammer. Yellowhammer was a new mining town constructed mainly of canvas and undressed pine. Cherokee was a prospector. One day, while his burrow was eating quartz and pine burrs, Cherokee turned up with his pick a nugget weighing 30 ounces. He staked his claim and then, being a man of breadth and hospitality, sent out invitations to his friends in three states to drop in and share his luck. Not one of the invited guests sent regrets. They rolled in from the Gila country, from Salt River, from the Picos, from Albuquerque and Phoenix and Santa Fe, and from the camps intervening. When a thousand citizens had arrived and taken up claims, they named the town Yellowhammer, appointed a vigilance committee, and presented Cherokee with a watch chain made of nuggets. Three hours after the presentation ceremonies, Cherokee's claim played out. He had located a pocket instead of a vein. He abandoned it and staked others one by one. Luck had kissed her hand to him. Never afterward did he turn up enough dust in Yellowhammer to pay his barbell. But his thousand invited guests were mostly prospering, and Cherokee smiled and congratulated them. Yellowhammer was made up of men who took off their hats to a smiling loser, so they invited Cherokee to say what he wanted. Me, said Cherokee, oh, grub steaks will be about the thing. I reckon I'll prospect along up in the Mariposas. If I strike it up there, I'll most certainly let you all know about the facts. I never was any hand to hold out cards on my friends. In May, Cherokee packed his burrow, and turned its thoughtful mouse-colored forehead to the north. Many citizens escorted him to the undefined limits of Yellowhammer, and bestowed upon him shouts of commendation and farewells. Five pocket flasks without an air-bubble between contents and cork were forced upon him, and he was bidden to consider Yellowhammer in perpetual commission for his bed, bacon and eggs, and hot water for shaving in the event that luck did not see fit to warm her hands by his campfire in the mariposas. The name of the father of Yellowhammer was given him by the gold hunters in accordance with their popular system of nomenclature. It was not necessary for a citizen to exhibit his baptismal certificate in order to acquire a cognomen. A man's name was his personal property. For convenience in calling him up to the bar and in designating him among other blue-shirted bipeds, a temporary appellation, title, or epithet was conferred upon him by the public. Personal peculiarities formed the source of the majority of such informal baptisms. Many were easily dubbed geographically from the regions from which they confessed to have hailed. Some announced themselves to be Thompsons and Adamses and the like, with a brazenness and loudness that cast a cloud upon their titles. A few vaingloriously and shamelessly uncovered their proper and indisputable names. This was held to be unduly arrogant and did not win popularity. One man, who said he was Chesterton L. C. Belmont and proved it by letters, was given till sundown to leave the town. Such names as Shorty, Bowlegs, Texas, Lazy Bill, Thirsty Rogers, Limping Riley, The Judge, and California Ed were in favor. Cherokee derived his title from the fact that he claimed to have lived for a time with that tribe and the Indian nation. On the 20th day of December, Baldy, the mail rider, brought Yellowhammer a piece of news. What do I see in Albuquerque, said Baldy to the patrons of the bar, but Cherokee all embellished and festooned up like the Tsar of Turkey and lavishing money in bulk. Him and me seen the elephant and the owl, and we had specimens of his Sidlitz powder wine, and Cherokee, he audits all the bills, C.O.D. His pockets looked like a pool stables after a fifteen-ball run. Cherokee must have struck payor, remarked California Ed. 
Well, he's white. I'm much obliged to him for his success. Seems like Cherokee would ramble down to Yellowhammer and see his friend, said another, slightly aggrieved. But that's the way. Prosperity is the finest cure there is for lost forgetfulness. You wait, said Baldy. I'm coming to that. Cherokee strikes a three-foot vein up in the Mariposas, that is says a trip to Europe to the ton, and he closes it out to a syndicate outfit for a hundred thousand hasty dollars in cash. Then he buys himself a baby sealskin overcoat and a red sleigh, and what do you think he takes it in his head to do next? chuck a luck said Texas, whose ideas of recreation were the gamesters. Come and kiss me, ma honey, sang Shorty, who carried tin types in his pocket and wore a red necktie while working on his claim. Bought a saloon, suggested Thirsty Rogers. Cherokee took me to a room, continued Baldy, and showed me. He's got that room full of drums and dolls and skates and bags of candy and jumping jacks and toy lamps and whistles and such infantile truck. And what do you think he's going to do with them inefficacious knick-knacks? Don't surmise none, Cherokee told me. He's going to lead them up in his red sleigh and... Wait a minute, don't order no drinks yet. He's going to drive down here to Yellowhammer and give the kids... The kids of this here town... The biggest Christmas tree and the biggest crying doll and little giant boy's tool chest blowout that was ever seen west of the Cape Hatteras. Two minutes of absolute silence ticked away in the wake of Baldy's words. It was broken by the house, who, happily conceiving the moment to be ripe for extending hospitality, sent a dozen whiskey glasses spinning down the bar, with a slower traveling bottle bringing up the rear. Didn't you tell him? asked the miner called Trinidad. Well, no, answered Baldy pensively. I never exactly seen my way to... You see, Cherokee had this Christmas mess already bought and paid for, and he was all flattered up with self-esteem over his idea. And we had in a way flew the flume with that fizzy wine I speak of, so I never let on. I cannot refrain from a certain amount of surprise, said the judge, as he hung his ivory-handled cane on the bar, that our friend Cherokee should possess such an erroneous conception of uh, his, uh, as it were, own town. Oh, it ain't the eighth wonder of the terrestrial world, said Baldy. Cherokee's been gone from Yellowhammer over seven months. Lots of things could happen in that time. How's he to know that there ain't a single kid in this town, and so far as immigration is concerned, none expected? Come to think of it, remarked California Ed, it's funny some ain't drifted in. Town ain't settled enough yet for to bring in the robbering brigade, I reckon. To top off this Christmas tree splurge of Cherokees, went on Baldy, he's going to give an imitation of Santa Claus. He's got a white wig and whiskers that disfigure him up exactly like the pictures of this William Cullen Longfellow in the box, and a red suit of fur-trimmed outside underwear, and eight-ounce gloves, and a stand-up, lay-down, crocheted red cap. Ain't it a shame that an outfit like that can't get a chance to connect with Annie and Willie's prayer layout? When does Cherokee allow to come over with his truck, inquired Trinidad. Morning before Christmas, said Baldy. And he wants you folks to have a room fixed up and a tree hauled and ready. And such ladies to assist as can stop breathing long enough to let it be a surprise for the kids. The unblessed condition of Yellowhammer had been truly described. The voice of childhood had never gladdened its flimsy structures. The patter of restless little feet had never consecrated the one rugged highway between the two rows of tents and rough buildings. Later they would come, but now Yellowhammer was but a mountain camp, and nowhere in it were the roguish, expectant eyes opening wide at dawn of the enchanting day, the eager, small hands to reach for Santa's bewildering horde, the elated, childish voicings of the season's joy, such as the coming good things of the warm-hearted Cherokee deserve. Of women, there were five in Yellowhammer. The assayer's wife, the proprietress of the Lucky Strike Hotel, and a laundress whose washtub panned out an ounce of dust a day. These were the permanent feminines. The remaining two were the Spangler sisters, Mrs. Fenchon and Irma, of the Transcontinental Comedy Company, then playing in repertoire at the improvised Empire Theatre. 
but of children there were none sometimes miss fanchon enacted with spirit and addressed the part of robustious childhood but between her delineation and the visions of adolescence that the fancy offered as eligible recipients of cherokee's holiday stores there seemed to be fixed a gulf christmas would come on thursday on tuesday morning trinidad instead of going to work sought the judge at the lucky strike hotel it'll be a disgrace to yellowhammer said trinidad if it throws cherokee down on his christmas tree blowout you might say that that man made this town for one i'm going to see what can be done to give santa claus a square deal my corporation said the judge would be gladly forthcoming i am indebted to cherokee for past favors but i do not see i have heretofore regarded the absence of children rather as a luxury but in this instance still i do not see look at me said trinidad and you'll see old ways and means with the fur on i'm going to hitch up a team and rustle a load of kids for cherokee santa claus act if i have to rob an orphan asylum eureka cried the judge enthusiastically no you didn't said trinidad decidedly i found it myself i learned about that latin word at school i will accompany you declared the judge waving his cane perhaps such eloquence and gift of language as i possess will be of benefit in persuading our young friends to lend themselves to our project within an hour yellowhammer was acquainted with the scheme of trinidad and the judge and approved of it citizens who knew of families with offspring within a forty-mile radius of yellowhammer came forward and contributed their information trinidad made careful notes of all such and then hastened to secure a vehicle and team the first stop scheduled was at a double log house fifteen miles out from yellowhammer a man opened the door at trinidad's hail and then came down and leaned upon the rickety gate the doorway was filled with a close mass of youngsters some ragged all full of curiosity and health this is the way explained trinidad we're from yellowhammer and we come kidnappin in a gentle kind of way one of our leading citizens is stung with a santa claus affliction and he's due in town tomorrow with half the folderols that's painted red and made in germany the youngest kid we got in yellowhammer packs a forty-five and a safety razor consequently we're mighty shy on anybody to say oh and ah when we light the candles on the christmas tree now partner if you loan us a few kids we guarantee to return them safe and sound on christmas day and they'll come back loaded down with a good time and swiss family robinsons and cornucopias and red drums and similar testimonials what do you say in other words said the judge we have discovered for the first time in our embryonic but progressive little city the inconveniences of the absence of adolescence the season of the year having approximately arrived during which it is a custom to bestow frivolous but often appreciated gifts upon the young and tender i understand said the parent packing his pipe with a forefinger i guess i needn't detain you gentlemen me and the old woman have got seven kids so to speak and running my mind over the bunch i don't appear to hit upon none that we could spare for you to take over to your doings the old woman has got some popcorn candy and rag dolls hid in the cloth chest and we allow to give christmas a little whirl of our own in an insignificant sort of style no i couldn't with any degree of avidity seem to fall in with the idea of letting none of them go thank you kindly gentlemen down the slope they drove and up another foothill to the ranch house of wiley wilson trinidad recited his appeal and the judge boomed out his ponderous antiphony mrs wiley gathered her two rosy-cheeked youngsters close to her skirts and did not smile until she had seen wiley laugh and shake his head again a refusal trinidad and the judge vainly exhausted more than half their list before twilight set in among the hills they spent the night at a stage road hostelry and set out again early the next morning the wagon had not acquired a single passenger it's creepin upon my faculties remarked trinidad that borrowing kids at christmas is something like trying to steal butter from a man that's got hot pancakes a-comin it is undoubtedly an indisputable fact said the judge that the ah uh, family ties seem to be more coherent and assertive at that period of the year 
On the day before Christmas, they drove thirty miles, making four fruitless halls and appeals. Everywhere they found kids at a premium. The sun was low when the wife of a section boss on a lonely railroad huddled her unavailable progeny behind her and said, There's the woman that just took charge of the railroad eating house down at Granite Junction. I hear she's got a little boy. Maybe she might let him go. Trinidad pulled up his mules at Granite Junction at five o'clock in the afternoon. The train had just departed with its loads of fed and appeased passengers. On the steps of the eating house, they found a thin and glowering boy of ten smoking a cigarette. The dining room had been left in chaos by the peripatetic appetites. A youngish woman reclined, exhausted, in a chair. Her face wore sharp lines of worry. She had once possessed a certain style of beauty that would never wholly leave her and would never wholly return. Trinidad set forth his mission. I'd count it a mercy if you'd take Bobby for a while, she said wearily. I'm on the go from morning till night and I don't have time to tend to him. He's learning bad habits from the man. It'll be the only chance he'll have to get any Christmas. The man went outside and conferred with Bobby. Trinidad pictured the glories of the Christmas tree and presents in lively colors. And moreover, my young friend, added the judge, Santa Claus himself will personally distribute the offerings that will typify the gifts conveyed by the shepherds of Bethlehem to... Oh, come off, said the boy, squinting his small eyes. I ain't no kid. There ain't any Santa Claus. It's your folks that buy toys and sneaks them in when you're asleep. And they make marks in the soot and the chimney with the tongues to look like Santa's sleigh tracks. That might be so, argued Trinidad, but Christmas trees ain't no fairy tale. There's one going to look like the ten cents store in Albuquerque, all strung up in a redwood. There's tops and drums and Noah's arks and... Oh, red, said Bobby wearily. I cut them out long ago. I'd like to have a rifle. Not a target one, a real one, to shoot wildcats with. But I guess you won't have any of them on your tree. Well, I can't say for sure, said Trinidad diplomatically. It might be. You go along with us and see. The hope thus held out, though faint, won the boy's hesitating consent to go. With the solitary beneficiary for Cherokee's holiday bounty, the canvases spun along the homeward road. In Yellowhammer, the empty storeroom had been transformed into what might have passed as the bower of an Arizona ferry. The ladies had done their work well. A tall Christmas tree covered to the topmost branch with candles, spangles, and toys sufficient for more than a score of children stood in the center of the floor. Near sunset, anxious eyes had begun to scan the streets for the returning team of the child providers. At noon that day, Cherokee had dashed into town with his new sleigh piled high with bundles and boxes and bales of all sizes and shapes. So intent was he upon the arrangement for his altruistic plans that the dearth of children did not receive his notice. No one gave away the humiliating state of Yellowhammer, for the efforts of Trinidad and the judge were expected to supply the deficiency. When the sun went down, Cherokee, with many wings and arch grins on his seasoned face, went into retirement with a bundle containing the Santa Claus raiment and a pack containing special and undisclosed gifts. When the kids are rounded up, he instructed uh, the volunteer arrangement committee, light up the candles on the tree and set them to playing Pussy Wants a Corner and King William. When they get good at it, why, old Santa will slide in the door. I reckon there'll be plenty of gifts to go round. The ladies were flitting about the tree, giving it final touches that were never final. The Spangle sisters were there in costume as Lady Violet de Vera and Marie, the maid in their new drama, The Miner's Bride. The theater did not open until nine, and they were welcome assistants of the Christmas tree committee. Every minute, hats would pop out the door to look and listen for the approach of Trinidad's team, and now it became an anxious function, for night had fallen and it would soon be necessary to light the candles on the tree, and Cherokee was apt to make an eruption at any time in his Kris Kringle garb. At length, the wagon of the child restless rattled down the street to the door. 
the ladies with little screams of excitement flew to the lightning of the candles the men of yellowhammer passed in and out restlessly or stood about the room in embarrassed groups trinidad and the judge bearing the marks of protracted travel entered conducting between them a single impish boy who stared with sullen pessimistic eyes at the gaudy tree where are the other children asked the assayer's wife the acknowledged leader of all social functions ma'am said trinidad with a sigh prospectin for kids at christmas time is like hunting in a limestone for silver this parental business is one that i haven't no chance to comprehend it seems like fathers and mothers are willing for their offsprings to be drowned stole fed on poison oak and add by catamount three hundred sixty four days in the year but on christmas day they insist on enjoying the exclusive mortification of the company this here young biped ma'am is all that washes out of our two days manoeuvres oh the sweet little boy cooed miss irma trailing her devere ropes to the centre of stage oh shut up said bobby with a scowl who's a kid you ain't you bet fresh bread breathed miss irma beneath her enamelled smile we done the best we could said trinidad stuff on cherokee but it can't be helped then the door opened and cherokee entered in the conventional dress of saint nick a wide rippling beard and flowing hair covered his face almost to his dark and shining eyes over his shoulder he carried a pack no one stirred as he came in even the spanglish sisters seized their coquettish poses and stared curiously at the tall figure bobby stood with his hands in his pockets gazing gloomily at the effeminate and childish tree cherokee put down his pack and looked wonderingly about the room perhaps he fancied that a bevy of eager children were being herded somewhere to be loosened upon his entrance he went up to bobby and extended his red mittened hand merry christmas little boy said cherokee anything on the tree you want they'll get it down for you won't you shake hands with santa claus there ain't any santa claus whined the boy you've got old false billy goat's whiskers on your face i ain't no kid what do i want with dolls and tin horses the driver said you'd had a rifle and you haven't i want to go home trinidad stepped into the breach he shook cherokee's hand in warm greeting i'm sorry cherokee he explained there never was a kid in yellowhammer we tried to rustle a bunch of em for your soiree but this sardine was all we could catch he's a atheist or nothing worth mentioning we can dump the stuff down a shaft or throw it away i don't know what i was thinking about but it never occurred to my cogitations that there wasn't any kids in yellowhammer meanwhile the company had relaxed into a hollow but praiseworthy imitation of a pleasure gathering bobby had retreated to a distant chair and was coldly regarding the scene with ennui plastered thick upon him cherokee lingering with his original idea went over and sat beside him where do you live little boy he asked respectfully granite junction said bobby without emphasis the room was warm cherokee took off his cap and then removed his beard and wig say exclaimed bobby with a show of interest i know your mag all right did you ever see me before asked cherokee i don't know but i've seen your picture lots of times where the boy hesitated on the bureau at home he answered let's have your name if you please buddy robert lumsden the picture belongs to my mother she puts it under her pillow of nights and once i saw her kiss it i wouldn't but women are that way cherokee rose and beckoned to trinidad keep this boy by you till i come back he said i'm going to shed these christmas darts and hitch up my sleigh i'm going to take this kid home well infidel said trinidad taking cherokee's vacant chair and so you are too superannuated and effete to yearn for such mockeries as candy and toys it seems i don't like you said bobby with acrimony you said there would be a rifle a fellow can't even smoke i wish i was at home cherokee drove his sleigh to the door and they lifted bobby in beside him the team of fine horses sprang away prancingly over the hard snow 
Cherokee had on his $500 overcoat of baby sealskin. The lap rope that he drew about them was as warm as velvet. Bobby slipped a cigarette from his pocket and was trying to snap a match. Throw that cigarette away, said Cherokee in a quiet but new voice. Bobby hesitated and then dropped the cylinder overboard. Throw the box too, commanded the new voice. More reluctantly, the boy obeyed. Say, said Bobby presently, I like you. I don't know why. Nobody ever made me do anything I didn't want to do before. Tell me, kid, said Cherokee, not using his new voice. Are you sure your mother kissed that picture that looks like me? Dad, sure, I seen her do it. Didn't you remark something a while ago about wanting a rifle? You bet I did. Will you get me one? Tomorrow, silver mounted. Cherokee took out his watch. We'll hit the junction plum on time with Christmas Day. Are you cold? Sit closer, son. End of Christmas by Injunction Section 18 of The Heart of the West This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Wendell. Heart of the West by O. Henry. A Chaparral Prince. Nine o'clock at last, and the drudging toil of the day was ended. Lena climbed to her room in the third half-story of the Quarryman's Hotel. Since daylight she had slaved, doing the work of a full-grown woman, scrubbing the floors, washing the heavy ironstone plates and cups, making the beds, and supplying the insatiate demands for wood and water in that turbulent and depressing hostelry. The din of the day's quarrying was over, the blasting and drilling, the creaking of the great cranes, the shouts of the foreman, the backing and shifting of the flat cars hauling the heavy blocks of limestone. Down in the hotel office three or four of the laborers were growling and swearing over a belated game of checkers. Heavy odors of stewed meat, hot grease, and cheap coffee hung like a depressing fog about the house. Lena lit the stump of a candle and sat limply upon her wooden chair. She was eleven years old, thin and ill-nourished. Her back and limbs were sore and aching, but the ache in her heart made the biggest trouble. The last straw had been added to the burden upon her small shoulders. They had taken away Grim. Always at night, however tired she might be, she had turned to Grim for comfort and hope. Each time had Grim whispered to her that the prince or the fairy would come and deliver her out of the wicked enchantment. Every night she had taken fresh courage and strength from Grim. To whatever tale she read, she found an analogy in her own condition. The woodcutter's lost child, the unhappy goose girl, the persecuted stepdaughter, the little maiden imprisoned in the witch's hut. All these were but transparent disguises for Lena, the overworked kitchen maid in the quarryman's hotel. And always, when the extremity was direst, came the good fairy or the gallant prince to the rescue. So here, in the ogre's castle, enslaved by a wicked spell, Lena had leaned upon Grimm and waited, longing for the powers of goodness to prevail. But on the day before Mrs. Maloney had found the book in her room and had carried it away, declaring simply that it would not do for servants to read at night, they lost sleep and did not work briskly the next day. Can one only eleven years old, living away from one's mamma, and never having had time to play, live entirely deprived of grim? Just try it once, and you will see what a difficult thing it is. Lena's home was in Texas, way up among the little mountains on the Perdanalus River, in a little town called Fredericksburg. They are all German people who live in Fredericksburg. Of evenings they sit at little tables along the sidewalk and drink beer and play pinochle and scat. They are very thrifty people. Thriftiest among them was Peter Hildesmuller, Lena's father, and that is why Lena was sent to work in the hotel at the quarries thirty miles away. She earned three dollars every week there, and Peter added 
her wages to his well-guarded store. Peter had an ambition to become as rich as his neighbor, Hugo Heffelbauer, who smoked a meerschaum pipe three feet long and had wiener schnitzel and hassenpfeffer for dinner every day in the week. And now Lena was quite old enough to work and assist in the accumulation of riches. But conjecture, if you can, what it means to be sentenced at eleven years of age from a home in the pleasant little Rhine village to hard labor in the ogre's castle, where you must fly to serve the ogres while they devour cattle and sheep, growling fiercely as they stamp white limestone dust from their great shoes for you to sweep and scour with your weak, aching fingers, and then to have grim taken away from you. Lena raised the lid of an old empty case that had once contained canned corn and got out a sheet of paper and a piece of pencil. She was going to write a letter to her mama. Tommy Ryan was going to post it for her at Bollinger's. Tommy was seventeen, worked in the quarries, went home to Bollinger's every night, and was now waiting in the shadows under Lena's window for her to throw the letter out to him. That was the only way she could send a letter to Fredericksburg. Mrs. Maloney did not like for her to write letters. The stump of the candle was burning low, so Lena hastily bit the wood from around the lead of her pencil and began. This is the letter she wrote. Dearest Mama, I want so much to see you, and Gretel and Klaus and Heinrich and little Adolf. I am so tired. I want to see you. Today I was slapped by Mrs. Maloney and had no supper. I could not bring in enough wood, for my hand hurt. She took my book yesterday, I mean Grimm's Fairy Tales, which Uncle Leo gave me. It did not hurt for anyone for me to read the book. I try to work as well as I can, but there is so much to do. I read only a little bit every night. Dear Mama, I shall tell you what I am going to do. Unless you send for me tomorrow to bring me home, I shall go to a deep place I know in the river and drown. It is wicked to drown, I suppose, but I wanted to see you, and there is no one else. I am very tired, and Tommy is waiting for the letter. You will excuse me, Mama, if I do it. Your respectful and loving daughter, Lena. Tommy was still waiting faithfully when the letter was concluded, and when Lena dropped it out, she saw him pick it up and start up the steep hillside. Without undressing, she blew out the candle and curled herself upon the mattress on the floor. At 10.30 o'clock, old man Bollinger came out of his house in his stocking feet and leaned over the gate, smoking his pipe. He looked down the big road, white in the moonshine, and rubbed one ankle with the toe of his other foot. It was time for the Fredericksburg mail to come pattering up the road. Old man Bollinger had waited only a few minutes when he heard the lively hoofbeats of Fritz's team of little black mules, and very soon afterward his covered spring wagon stood in front of the gate. Fritz's big spectacles flashed in the moonlight, and his tremendous voice shouted a greeting to the postmaster of Bollinger's. The mail carrier jumped out and took the bridles from the mules, for he always fed them oats at Bollinger's. While the mules were eating from their feed bags, old man Bollinger brought out the mail sack and threw it into the wagon. Fritz Bergman was a man of three sentiments, or to be more accurate, four, the pair of mules deserving to be reckoned individually. Those mules were the chief interest and joy of his existence. Next came the Emperor of Germany and Lena Hildesmuller. Tell me, said Fritz when he was ready to start, contains the sack a letter to Frau Hildesmuller? from the little Lena at the quarries? One came in the last mail to say that she is a little sick already. Her mamma is very anxious to hear again. Yes, said old man Bollinger. Thar is a letter for Mrs. Helterskelter, or some such name. Tommy Ryan brung it over when he come. Her little gal working over there, you say. In the hotel, shouted Fritz, as he gathered up the lines. Eleven years old, and not bigger as a Frankfurter. The closed fist of a Peter Hildesmuller. Some day I shall with a big club pound that man's Dumkoff. All in and out the town. Perhaps in this letter, Lena will say that she is yet feeling better, so her mamma will be glad. Auf Wiedersehen, Herr Bollinger. Your feet will take cold out in the air. 
So long, Fritzy, said old man Bollinger. You got a good, cool night for your drive. Up the road went the little black mules at their steady trot, while Fritz thundered at them occasional words of endearment and cheer. These fancies occupied the mind of the mail carrier until he reached the big post oak forest, eight miles from Bollinger's. Here his ruminations were scattered by the sudden flash and report of pistols, and a whooping as if from a whole tribe of Indians. A band of galloping centaurs closed in around the mail wagon. One of them leaned over the front wheel, covered the driver with his revolver, and ordered him to stop. Others caught at the bridles of Donder and Blitzen. Donner wetter, shouted Fritz, with all his tremendous voice. What ist? Release your hands from those mules. We was der United States mail. Hurry up, Dutch, drawled a melancholy voice. Don't you know when you're in a stick-up? Reverse your mules and climb out of the cart. It is due to the breadth of Hondo Bill's demerit and the largeness of his achievements to state that the holding up of the Fredericksburg mail was not perpetrated by way of an exploit. As the lion, while in the pursuit of prey, commensurate to his prowess, might set a frivolous foot upon a casual rabbit in his path, so Hondo Bill and his gang had swooped sportively upon the Pacific transport of Meinherr Fritz. The real work of their sinister night ride was over. Fritz and his mailbag and his mules came as gentle relaxation, grateful after the arduous duties of their profession. Twenty miles to the southeast stood a train with a killed engine, hysterical passengers, and a looted express and mail car. That represented the serious occupation of Hondo Bill and his gang. With a fairly rich prize of currency and silver, the robbers were making a wide detour to the west, through the less populous country intending to seek safety in mexico by means of some fordable spot on the rio grande the booty from the train had melted the desperate bushrangers to jovial and happy skylarkers trembling with outraged dignity and no little personal apprehension fritz climbed out to the road after replacing his suddenly removed spectacles the band had dismounted and were singing capering and whooping thus expressing their satisfied delight in the life of a jolly outlaw Rattlesnake Rogers, who stood at the heads of the mules, jerked a little too vigorously at the rein of the tender-mouthed Donder, who reared and emitted a loud, protesting snort of pain. Instantly, Fritz, with a scream of anger, flew at the bulky Rogers and began to assiduously pummel that surprised freebooter with his fists. Villain! shouted Fritz. Dog! Big stiff! That mule has a soreness by his mouth. I will knock off your shoulders mit your head, rubbermans! Yay! yelled Rattlesnake, roaring with laughter and ducking his head. <laughs> Somebody get this here sauerkraut off of me! <laughs> One of the band yanked Fritz by the coattail, and the woods rang with Rattlesnake's vociferous comments. The dog gone little wienerwurst, he yelled amiably. He's not so much of a skunk for a Dutchman. Took up for his animile plum quick, didn't he? Like to see a man like his hoss, even if it is a mule. Dad blamed little Limburger. He went for me, didn't he? Oh, now, Bewley, I ain't gonna hurt you with your mouth any more again. Perhaps the mail would not have been tampered with had not Ben Moody, the lieutenant, possessed certain wisdom that seemed to promise more spoils. Say, Cap, he said, addressing Hondo Bill, there's likely to be good pickings in these mail sacks. I've done some hoss trading with those Dutchmen around Fredericksburg, and I know the style of the varmints. There's big money goes through the mails to that town. Them Dutch risk a thousand dollars sent wrapped in a piece of paper before they'd pay the banks to handle the money. Hondo Bill, six feet two, gentle of voice and impulsive in action, was dragging the sacks from the rear of the wagon before Moody had finished his speech. A knife shone in his hand, and they heard the ripping sound as it bit through the tough canvas. The outlaws crowded around and began tearing open letters and packages, enlivening their labors by swearing affably at the riders who seemed to have conspired to confute the prediction of Ben Moody. Not a dollar was found in the Fredericksburg mail. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, said Hondo Bill to the mail carrier in solemn tones, to be packing such a lot of old, trashy paper as this. What do you mean by it anyhow? Where do you Dutchers keep your money at? The Bollinger mail sack opened like a cocoon under Hondo's knife. 
It contained but a handful of mail. Fritz had been fuming with terror and excitement until this sack was reached. He now remembered Lena's letter. He addressed the leader of the band, asking that the particular missive be spared. Much obliged, Dutch, he said to the disturbed carrier. I guess that's the letter we want. Got spondulix in it, ain't it? Here she is. Make a light, boys. Hondo found and tore open the letter to Mrs. Hildesmuller. The others stood about, lighting twisted-up letters one from another. Hondo gazed with mute disapproval at the single sheet of paper covered with the angular German script. Whatever is this you've humbugged with us, Dutchy? You call this here a valuable letter? That's a mighty low-down trick to play on your friends, but come along to help you distribute your mail. That's Chinese writing, said Sandy Grundy, peering over Hondo's shoulder. Year off your kazip, declared another of the gang, an effective youth covered with silk handkerchiefs and nickel plating. That's shorthand. I see him do it once in court. Ach, no, 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 dat is German, said Fritz. It is no more as a little girl writing a letter to her mamma. One poor little girl, sick and working hard away from home. Ach, it is a shame. Good Mr. Robberman, will you please let me have dat letter? What the devil do you take us for, old pretzels? said Honda with sudden and surprising severity. You ain't presuming to insinuate that we gents ain't possessed of sufficient politeness for to take an interest in the missus' health, are ye? Now you go on and you read that scratchin' out loud and in plain United States language to this here company of educated society. Hondo twirled his six-shooter by his trigger guard and stood towering above the little German, who at once began to read the letter, translating the simple words into English. The gang of rovers stood in absolute silence, listening intently. "'How old is that kid?' asked Hondo when the letter was done. Eleven, said Fritz. "'And where is she at?' "'At those rock quarries, workin'. "'Ach, mein Gott! Little Lena, does she speak of drowning? "'I do not know if she will do it. "'But if she shall, I swear I will dot Peter Hildesmuller shoot me the gun.' You Dutchers, said Hondo Bill, his voice swelling with contempt, make me plenty tired, hiring out your kids to work when they ought to be playing dolls in the sand. You're a hell of a sect of people. I reckon we'll fix your clock for a while, just to show what we think of your old cheesy nation. Here, boys. Hondo Bill parlayed aside briefly with his band, and then seized Fritz and conveyed him off the road to one side. Here they bound him fast to a tree with a couple of lariats. His team they tied to another tree nearby. We ain't gonna hurt you bad, said Hondo reassuringly. Don't hurt you to be tied up for a while. We will now pass you the time of day, as it is up to us to depart. Oscar Spiel. Nix cumorous, Dutchy. Don't get any more impatience. Fritz heard a great squeaking of saddles as the men mounted their horses. Then a loud yell and a great clatter of hoofs as they galloped pell-mell back along the Fredericksburg Road. For more than two hours, Fritz sat against his tree, tightly but not painfully bound. Then, from the reaction after his exciting adventure, he sank into slumber. How long he slept he knew not, but he was at last awakened by a rough shake. Hands were untying his ropes. He was lifted to his feet, dazed, confused in mind, and weary of body. Rubbing his eyes, he looked and saw that he was again in the midst of the same band of terrible bandits. They shoved him up to the seat of his wagon and placed the lines in his hands. Head out for home, Dutch, said Hondo Bill's voice commandingly. You've given us lots of trouble, and we're pleased to see the back of your neck. Spiel! Zwiebier! Vamoose! Hondo reached out and gave Blitzen a smart cut with his quirt. The little mules sprang ahead, glad to be moving again. Fritz urged them along, himself dizzy and muddled over his fearful adventure. According to schedule time, he should have reached Fredericksburg at daylight. As it was, he drove down the long street of the town at eleven o'clock a.m. He had to pass Peter Hildesmuller's house on his way to the post office. He stopped his team at the gate and called, but Frau Hildesmuller was watching for him. Out rushed the whole family of Hildesmuller's. Frau Hildesmuller, fat and flushed, inquired if he had a letter from Lena, and then Fritz raised his voice and told the tale of his adventure. He told the contents of that letter that the robber had made him read, and then Frau Hildesmuller broke into wild weeping. 
her little Lena, drown herself. Why had they sent her from home? What could be done? Perhaps it would be too late by the time they could send for her now. Peter Hildesmuller dropped his meerschaum on the walk, and it shivered into pieces. Woman, he roared at his wife, why did you let that child go away? It is your fault if she comes home to us no more. Everyone knew that it was Peter Hildesmuller's fault, so they paid no attention to his words. A moment afterward, a strange, faint voice was heard to call, Mama. Frau Hildesmuller at first thought it was Lena's spirit calling, and then she rushed to the rear of Fritz's covered wagon and with a loud shriek of joy caught up Lena herself, covering her pale little face with kisses and smothering her with hugs. Lena's eyes were heavy with the deep slumber of exhaustion, but she smiled and lay close to the one she had longed to see. There among the mail sacks, covered in a nest of strange blankets and comforters, she had lain asleep until awakened by the voices around her. Fritz stared at her with eyes that bulged behind his spectacles. Got in himmel, he shouted. How did you get in that wagon? Am I going crazy as well as to be murdered and hanged by robbers this day? You brought her to us, Fritz, cried Frau Hildesmuller. How can we ever thank you enough? Tell Mama how you came in Fritz's wagon, said Frau Hildesmuller. I don't know, said Lena. But I know how I got away from the hotel. The prince brought me. By the emperor's crown, shouted Fritz. We are all going crazy. I always knew he would come, said Lena, sitting down on her bundle of bedclothes on the sidewalk. Last night he came with his armed knights and captured the ogre's castle. They broke the dishes and kicked down the doors. They pitched Mr. Maloney into a barrel of rainwater and threw flour all over Mrs. Maloney. The workmen in the hotel jumped out of the windows and ran into the woods when the knights began firing their guns. They wakened me up, and I peeped down the stair, and then the prince came up and wrapped me in the bedclothes and carried me out. He was so tall and strong and fine. His face was as rough as a scrubbing brush, and he talked soft and kind and smelled of schnapps. He took me on his horse before him, and we rode away among the knights. He held me close, and I went to sleep that way, and didn't wake up till I got home. Rubbish, cried Fritz Bergman. Fairy tales. How did you come from the quarries to my wagon? The prince brought me, said Lena confidently. And to this day, the good people of Fredericksburg haven't been able to make her give any other explanation. End of a Chaparral Prince Recording by Gary Wendell Section 19 of Heart of the West. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brett. Heart of the West by O. Henry. Section 19. Calliope Catesby was in his humors again. Ennui was upon him. This goodly promontory, the earth, particularly that portion of it known as quicksand, was to him no more than a pestilent congregation of vapors. Overtaken by the megrims, the philosopher may seek relief in soliloquy. My lady finds solace in tears. The flaccid Easterner scold at the millinery bills of his womenfolk. Such recourse was insufficient to the desians of quicksand. Calliope, especially, was wont to express his ennui according to his lights. Overnight Calliope had hung out signals of approaching low spirits. He had kicked his own dog on the porch of the Occidental Hotel and refused to apologize. He had become capricious and fault-finding in conversation. While strolling about he reached often for twigs of mesquite and chewed the leaves fiercely. That was always an ominous act. Another symptom alarming to those who were familiar with the different stages of his doldrums was his increasing politeness and a tendency to use formal phrases. A husky softness succeeded the usual penetrating drawl in his tones. A dangerous courtesy marked his manners. Later, his smile became crooked, the left side of his mouth slanting upward, 
and Quicksand got ready to stand from under. At this stage, Calliope generally began to drink. Finally, about midnight, he was seen going homeward, saluting those whom he met with exaggerated but inoffensive courtesy. Not yet was Calliope's melancholy at the danger point. He would seat himself at the window of the room he occupied over Sylvester's tonsorial parlors and there chant lugubrious and tuneless ballads until morning, accompanying the noises by appropriate maltreatment of a jangling guitar. More magnanimous than Nero, he would thus give musical warning of the forthcoming municipal upheaval that Quicksand was scheduled to endure. A quiet, amiable man was Calliope Catsby at other times, quiet to indolence and amiable to worthlessness. At best he was a loafer and a nuisance. At worst he was the terror of quicksand. His ostensible occupation was something subordinate in the real estate line. He drove the beguiled Easterner in buckboards out to look over lots and ranch property. Originally he came from one of the Gulf states, his lank six feet, slurring rhythm of speech and sectional idioms giving evidence of his birthplace. And yet, after taking on Western adjustments, this languid pine-box whittler, crackle-barrel hugger, shady corner lounger of the cotton fields and sumac hills of the South became famed as a bad man among men who made a lifelong study of the art of truculence. At nine the next morning Calliope was fit. Inspired by his own barbarous melodies and the contents of his jug, he was ready primed to gather fresh laurels from the diffident brow of quicksand. Encircled and crisscrossed with cartridge belts, abundantly garnished with revolvers, and copiously drunk, he poured forth into quicksand's main street. Too chivalrous to surprise and capture a town by silent sortie, he paused at the nearest corner and admitted his slogan, that fearful, brassy yell, so reminiscent of the steam piano, that had gained for him the classic appellation that had superseded his own baptismal name. Following close upon his vociferation came three shots from his forty-five, by way of limbering up the guns and testing his aim. A yellow dog, the personal property of Colonel Swayze, the proprietor of the Occidental, fell feet upward in the dust with one farewell yelp. A Mexican who was crossing the street from the Blue Front Grocery, carrying in his hand a bottle of kerosene, was stimulated to a sudden and admirable burst of speed, still grasping the neck of the shattered bottle. The new gilt weather clock on Judge Riley's lemon and ultramarine two-story residence shivered, flapped, and hung by a sliver, the sport of the wanton breezes. The artillery was in trim. Calliope's hand was steady. The high, calm ecstasy of habitual battle was upon him, though slightly embittered by the sadness of Alexander in that his conquests were limited to the small world of quicksand. Down the street went Calliope, shooting right and left. Glass fell like hail, dogs vamoosed, chickens flew, squawking. Feminine voices shrieked concernedly to youngsters at large. The din was perforated at intervals by the staccato of the terror's guns, and was drowned periodically by the brazen screech that Quicksand knew so well. The occasions of Calliope's low spirits were legal holidays in Quicksand. All along the main street, in advance of his coming, clerks were putting up shutters and closing doors. Business would languish for a space. The right of way was Calliope's, and as he advanced, observing the dearth of opposition and the few opportunities for distraction, his ennui perceptibly increased. But some four squares further down, lively preparations were being made to minister to Mr. Catesby's love for interchange of compliments and repartee. On the previous night, numerous messengers had hastened to advise Buck Patterson, the city marshal, of Calliope's impending eruption. The patience of that official, often strained in extending leniency toward the disturber's misdeeds, had been overtaxed. In quicksand, some indulgence was accorded the natural ebullition of human nature. Providing that the lives of the more useful citizens were not recklessly squandered, or too much properly needlessly laid waste, the community sentiment was against a too strict enforcement of the law. 
but Calliope had raised the limit. His outburst had been too frequent and too violent to come within the classification of a normal and sanitary relaxation of spirit. Buck Patterson had been expecting and awaiting in his little ten-by-twelve frame office that preliminary yell announcing that Calliope was feeling blue. When this signal came, the city marshal rose to his feet and buckled on his guns. Two deputy sheriffs and three citizens who had proven the edible qualities of fire also stood up, ready to bandy with Calliope's leaden jocularities. "'Gather that fellow in,' said Buck Patterson, setting forth the lines of the campaign. "'Don't have no talk, but shoot as soon as you can get a show. Keep behind cover and bring him down. He's a no good un. It's up to Calliope to turn up his toes this time, I reckon.' Go to him all spraddled out, boys, and don't get too reckless, for what Calliope shoots at, he hits. Buck Patterson, tall, muscular, and solemn-faced, with his bright city marshal badge shining on the breast of his blue flannel shirt, gave his posse directions for the onslaught upon Calliope. The plan was to accomplish the downfall of the quicksand terror without loss to the attacking party, if possible. The splenetic Calliope, unconscious of retributive plots, was steaming down the channel, cannonading on either side when he suddenly became aware of breakers ahead. The city marshal and one of the deputies rose up behind some dry goods boxes half a square to the front and opened fire. At the same time the rest of the posse, divided, shelled him from two side streets up which they were cautiously maneuvering from a well-executed detour. The first volley broke the lock of one of Calliope's guns, cut a neat underbit in his right ear, and exploded a cartridge in his cross-belt, scorching his ribs as it burst. Feeling braced up by this unexpected tonic to his spiritual depression, Calliope executed a fortissimo note from his upper register and returned the fire like an echo. The upholders of the law dodged at his flash, but a trifle too late to save one of the deputies a bullet just above the elbow, and the marshal a bleeding cheek from a splinter that a ball tore from the box he had ducked behind. And now Calliope met his enemy's tactics in kind, choosing with a rapid eye the street from which the weakest and least accurate fire had come. He invaded it at a double quick, abandoning the unprotected middle of the street. With rare cunning the opposing force in that direction, one of the deputies and two of the valorous volunteers waited, concealed by beer barrels, until Calliope had passed their retreat and then peppered him from the rear. In another moment they were reinforced by the marshal and his other men, and then Calliope felt that in order to successfully prolong the delights of the controversy he must find some means of reducing the great odds against him. His eye fell upon a structure that seemed to hold out this promise, providing he could reach it. Not far away was the little railroad station, its building a strong box house ten by twenty feet, resting upon a platform four feet above ground. Windows were in each of its walls, something like a fort it might become to a man thus sorely pressed by superior numbers. Calliope made a bold and rapid spurt for it, the marshal's crowd smoking him as he ran. He reached the haven in safety, the station agent leaving the building by a window like a flying squirrel as the garrison entered the door. Patterson and his supporters halted under protection of a pile of lumber and held consultations. In the station was an unterrified desperado who was an excellent shot and carried an abundance of ammunition. For thirty yards on either side of the besieged was a stretch of bare open ground. It was a sure thing that the man who attempted to enter that unprotected area would be stopped by one of Calliope's bullets. The city marshal was resolved. He had decided that Calliope Catesby should no more wake the echoes of quicksand with his strident whoop. He had so announced. Officially and personally he felt imperatively bound to put the soft pedal on that instrument of discord. It played bad tunes. Standing near was a hand truck used in the manipulation of small freight. It stood by a shed full of sacked wool, a consignment from one of the sheep ranches. On this truck the marshal and his men piled three heavy sacks of wool. Stooping low, 
Buck Patterson started for Calliope's fort, slowly pushing this loaded truck before him for protection. The posse, scattering broadly, stood ready to nip the besieged in case he should show himself in an effort to repel the juggernaut of justice that was creeping upon him. Only once did Calliope make demonstration. He fired from a window, and some tufts of wool spurted from the marshal's trustworthy bulwark. The return shots from the posse pattered against the window frame of the fort. No loss resulted on either side. The marshal was too deeply engrossed in steering his protected battleship to be aware of the approach of the morning train until he was within a few feet of the platform. The train was coming up on the other side of it. It stopped only one minute in quicksand. What an opportunity it would offer to Calliope. He had only to step out the other door, mount the train, and away. Abandoning his breastwork, Buck, with his gun ready, dashed up the steps and into the room, driving upon the closed door with one heave of his weighty shoulder. The members of the posse heard one shot fired inside, and then there was silence. At length the wounded man opened his eyes. After a blank space he again could see and hear and feel and think. Turning his eyes about, he found himself lying on a wooden bench, a tall man with a perplexed countenance, wearing a big badge with city marshal engraved upon it, stood over him. A little old woman in black, with a wrinkled face and sparkling black eyes, was holding a wet handkerchief against one of his temples. He was trying to get these facts fixed in his mind and connected with past events when the old woman began to talk. There now, great big strong man. That bullet never touched you. Just skeeted along the side of your head and sort of paralyzed you for a spell. I've heard of such things afore. Concussion is what they names it. Abel Watkins used to kill squirrels that way. Barkin' em, Abe called it. You just been barked, sir, and you'll be all right in a little bit. Feel lots better already, don't ye? You just lay still a while longer and let me bathe your head. You don't know me, I reckon, and tain't surprising that you shouldn't. I come in on that train from Alabama to see my son. Big son, ain't he? Lands, you wouldn't hardly think he'd ever been a baby, would ye? This is my son, sir. Half turning, the old woman looked up at the standing man, her worn face lightening with a proud and wonderful smile. She reached out one veined and calloused hand and took one of her son's. Then, smiling cheerily down at the prostrate man, she continued to dip the handkerchief in the weighty room tin basin and gently apply it to his temple. She had the benevolent garrulity of old age. I ain't seen my son before, she continued, in eight years. One of my nephews, Elkanah Price, he's a conductor on one of them railroads, and he got me a pass to come out here. I can stay a whole week on it and then it'll take me back again. Just think now, that little boy of mine has got to be an officer, a city marshal of a whole town. That's something like a constable, ain't it? I never knowed he was an officer. He didn't say nothing about it in his letters. I reckon he thought his old mother'd be scared about the danger he was in. But laws, I never was much of a hand to get scared. Tain't no use. I heard them guns a-shootin' while I was getting off them cars, and I see smoke a-comin' out through the depot, but I just walked right along. Then I see Son's face looking out through the window. I knowed him at once it. He met me at the door and squeezes me most to death. And there you was, sir, a lying there just like you was dead, and I allowed we'd see what might be done to help sort you up. I think I'll sit up now, said the concussion patient. I'm feeling pretty fair by this time. He sat, somewhat weakly yet, leaning against the wall. He was a rugged man, big-boned and straight. His eyes, steady and keen, seemed to linger upon the face of the man standing so still above him. His look wandered often from the face he studied to the marshal's badge upon the other's breast. Yes, yes, you'll be all right, said the old woman, patting his arm. If you don't get to cutting up again and having folks shooting at you. Son told me about you, sir, while you was lying senseless on the floor. 
Don't you take it as meddlesome for an old woman with a son as big as you to talk about it. And you mustn't hold no grudge against my son for having to shoot at ye. An officer has got to take up for the law. It's his duty. And them that acts bad and lives wrong has to suffer. Don't blame my son any, sir. Tain't his fault. He's always been a good boy. Good when he was growing up, and kind and obedient and well-behaved. Won't you let me advise you, sir, not to do so no more? Be a good man, and leave liquor alone and live peacefully and goodly. Keep away from bad company, and work honest and sleep sweet. The black-mitted hand of the old pleader gently touched the breast of the man she addressed. Very earnest and candid her old, worn face looked. In her rusty black dress and antique bonnet she sat, near the close of a long life, and epitomized the experience of the world. Still the man to whom she spoke gazed above her head, contemplating the silent son of the old mother. "'What does the marshal say?' he asked. "'Does he believe the advice is good? Suppose the marshal speak up and says if the talk's all right.' The tall man moved uneasily. He fingered the badge on his breast for a moment, and then he put an arm around the old woman and drew her close to him. She smiled the unchanging mother smile of threescore years and patted his big brown hand with her crooked, mittened finger while her son spake. I says this, he said, looking squarely into the eyes of the other man, that if I was in your place I'd follow it. If I was a drunken, desperate character without shame or hope, I'd follow it. If I was in your place and you was in mine, I'd say, Marshal, I'm willing to swear if you'll give me a chance, I'll quit the racket. I'll drop the tangle foot and the gun play and won't play hoss no more. I'll be a good citizen and go to work and quit my foolishness, so help me God. That's what I'd say to you if you was Marshal and I was in your place. Hear my son talking, said the old woman softly. Hear him, sir. You promised to be good, and he won't do you no harm. Forty-one year ago his heart first beat again mine, and it's beat true ever since. The other man rose to his feet, trying his limbs and stretching his muscles. Then, he said, if you was in my place and said that, and I was marshal, I'd say, go free and do your best to keep your promise. Lawsy! exclaimed the old woman in a sudden flutter. If I didn't clear forget that chunk of mine. I see a man setting it on the platform just as I seen son's face in the window, and it went plumb out of my head. There's eight jars of homemade quince jam in that chunk that I made myself. I wouldn't have nothing happen to them jars for a red apple. Away to the door she trotted, spry and anxious, and then Calliope Catesby spoke out to Buck Patterson. I just couldn't help it, Buck. I seen her through the window of coming in. She never had heard a word about my tough ways. I didn't have the nerve to let her know I was a worthless cuss, being hunted down by the community. There you was, lying where my shot laid you, like you was dead. The idea struck me sudden, and I just took your badge off and fastened it onto myself, and I fastened my reputation onto you. I told her how I was the marshal, and you was a holy terror. You can take your badge back now, Buck. With shaking fingers, Calliope began to unfasten the disc of metal from his shirt. Easy there, said Buck Patterson. You keep that badge right where it is, Calliope Catesby. Don't you dare to take it off till the day your mother leaves this town. You'll be city marshal of quicksand as long as she's here to know it. After I stir around town a bit and put them on, I'll guarantee that nobody won't give the thing away to her. And say, you leather-headed, rip-roaring, low-down son of a locoed cyclone, you follow that advice she give me. I'm going to take some of it myself, too. Buck, said Calliope feelingly. If I don't, I hope I may. Shut up, said Buck. She's a-coming back. End of Section 19 Recording by Brett Booz End of Heart of the West by O. Henry